Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Schmidt, and I'd like to welcome you to genetics. In this session, and actually in this whole part, if you're going along in order, we're going to discuss some topics that may not immediately seem to go together, but there's a very definite reason that they do go together, and I designed it this way purposely. Two concepts that I want to bring together right now are, you can see that we're going to be discussing mutation in this part. And then in a subsequent part, we're going to be asking ourselves about the nature of the gene. Now, you almost might be thinking, gee, we've gone through a lot of the course by now. We don't even know what the nature of the gene is. But what I mean is, Mendel said that the gene was a unit of information. We know that they're on chromosomes. We now know that they're made of DNA. But we're still not at the molecular level getting to the point where, what does it mean, this thing that Mendel called Big P, somehow causing flowers to be purple? How does it cause that? And what exactly is it? We know it's got something to do with DNA, but what defines the gene? Is it, you know, 10 bases, base pairs, or we, we don't really know yet. Furthermore, we want to realize that mutation and mutational analysis is one of the best ways that we really were able to figure out what the heck a gene is at the molecular level. And that's one of the, the good reasons why the two go together. Also, so let's, let's start to focus on mutation here, but in this sort of introductory part, we'll go a little bit back and forth. Mutation, we want to, uh, we're going to get into a little bit of technicalities with respect to mutations, but a fundamental question exists, and that is this one. Ever since Mendel and subsequently on, we've seen that different alleles exist, big P, little p, red eyes, white eyes, whatever they may be. How do different alleles come into being? So without going into a long exposition on evolution, the assumption is that over time, uh, alleles are changing from one into another, and we'd like to know how that occurs. So it turns out that mutation is that thing that creates the raw material for evolution. Mutation does create new alleles. And it also turns out that that mutation is completely random. For some time, it was wondered or argued that, you know, these changes, are they somehow directed? Are they somehow anticipating the environment? It turns out that there's no way that could happen and that just random old changes um, come about that create new alleles. Again, while I love evolutionary science, we don't have time to go into it that much right now. But basically, you know, changes occur. Alleles confer on organisms different phenotypes and whether they can exist and reproduce. If they can, they do. If they don't, then, then they don't. And I know that sounds obvious, but that's the way natural selection works. So I guess the take-home message there is we're going to discuss mutations in more detail now. But the, in the grand scheme of things, that's how alleles come into being. Somehow, the, in the case of fruit flies, for example, the wild-type red-eyed allele uh, changed into one of the alleles that we discussed, the white eye allele, right? Just a random mutation. And now those flies that have that mutation have a different phenotype. Really, mutation, it's sort of a strange word, only in the sense that, you know, the term mutant you see in like uh, science fiction movies, and it seems like some crazy monster is a mutant or something. Mutant really, or mutation really only means change. It's not making a value judgment on whether that change is good or bad, which is even a hard thing to define sometimes, but it just, at the molecular level, which is what we want to get at here, mutation is defined as the process, whatever process that might be, by which a DNA sequence change is produced. Okay, we'll go into a little more detail, but we know that the bases go along, and if the base sequence changes, a mutation has occurred, and we want to find out why. We're not going to talk about this part right now, but large-scale chromosomal changes or aberrations are changes. I mean, they're, they're technically mutations, but we want to get more at mutations that are confined and smaller at the molecular level. So a first idea, a couple of first ideas, are that mutations can occur 
spontaneously. Now this word means slightly different things depending how it's used, but in this case it means it happens for no particular reason and just by random chance. It's usually due to a mistake that's made during DNA replication. Now you guys know that DNA polymerase has a fairly reasonable um, ability to fix mistakes that it sees that it made, but sometimes it either can't fix it or it doesn't see it. And if that mistake is left alone and not fixed, that can be the basis of a, a fundamental change that stays around. So that's a spontaneous mutation. Induced mutation, you get the idea that something from the outside is coming and, and interacting with perhaps DNA, we'll see. But any outside agent that has the ability to cause a change or a mutation in DNA is referred to, this is a good term to know, as a mutagen. It literally means the, the genesis or the beginning of change, a mutagen. Now, we have to be a little careful. This is not a super technical discussion that we're having right now. Um, but while genetic principles are very, very similar from, say, a bacterium to a, to a human and everything in between, there are obviously differences between bacteria and humans and everything in between. So if you think more along the lines of an of a animal, Mutations may occur in any one of the 30 trillion cells that exist in your body. And in that context, they're referred to as either occurring in a somatic cell. Now, somatic means body, but in the sense of an animal like you or I, it means all of the cells that are not having anything to do with sex, which are most of the ones in your body, right? So somatic cells exclude sperm, eggs, and those cells that are going to give rise to the sperm and eggs. Those cells are considered to be part of the so-called germline. And only mutations that occur in germline cells are actually going to be trans able to be transmitted to your actual offspring, right? So, I mean, if a mutation occurred in a cell in my arm, which probably is happening right now or sometime, um, in other words, it may be able to be passed on to its progenitor cells if mitosis is going on, but it would never get passed on to my child, to my offspring, right? So somatic mutations, it's not to say that they may not be, you know, affecting the actual life of an individual, but they're not going to be inheritable, only those that occur in the germline that are going to affect the quality genetically of the sperm or the egg. Um, a little minor, well, I don't know if it's minor, but it's a point here. Um, the term inheritable mutation can mean different things because, look, if it was a bacterium, right, there's no such thing as the body or somatic or sex or any of that stuff. So any mutation that occurs and exists stably in a bacterial cell is going to be passed on to its offspring, right? So in that sense, I'm uh, sorry if this is redundant, you know, if a mutation stably exists in any one of the cells of your body that's somatic, it could be thought of as inheritable by the daughter cells that are going to come about through mitosis of those cells. But in the context of a multicellular creature, we tend to think of inheritance more as giving this mutation to our offspring. So I hope you can see the, the difference there. All right, so what are the different types of mutations with respect to what's actually changing at the DNA level? A very important uh, and a type of mutation that you're definitely going to be expected to know is known as a point mutation. The idea of a point is that it just affects one particular point on the DNA. And in the most strict definition, which is probably the most correct one, it usually only affects one DNA base pair, just one out of the millions and millions that may exist. This can also, therefore, because a change is occurring at one base pair, this is, these types of changes can also be referred to as base pair substitution mutations. Because if one thing is, one base is changing to another, another way of saying that is that you're substituting one base for another. So those really mean the exact... Thing.